Let's start with the word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this time. We can begin another quarter. And as we go into one of the pulses of Christian living, that uh, fundamental concept of discipleship, may you show us through your spirit what it means to be a true disciple, and even a discipler for your kingdom. Uh, give us teachable minds and humble hearts and obedient hands and feet. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay, so we, we got done with the sanctuary last quarter. Um, I hope you picked up a lot of stuff. Uh, the whole quarter is in YouTube, so you can review. You can play it if you want to review some of the concepts we had. There are handouts in, in YouTube as well. Um, in fact, a lot of the things that I said in, a lot of the, the things that I said in, in the, in the, uh, SS lesson preview. I cannot remember everything. <laughs> so once in a while, I gotta go back and play it again, so I'll remember what they put together. There's there's so many notes. I was I I started cleaning up all the, the notes I have for the quarter. You, you know, if you look at if you go to my room, my room turns into a library, <laughs> and the materials are all over the place. Uh, it's amazing how many. I mean, some of the files are in my computer, and how many hard copies I printed. It was a very thick hard copy. I've been reading this. It's been very enriching, at least for me, to have read the sanctuary and get all those dimensions and angles I didn't see before. And uh, as uh, Dave, uh, Richard Davidson says, the more I study about the sanctuary and, and the more I study the Bible and the sanctuary, the more I'm convinced of how beautiful the message of the gospel is in the sanctuary infrastructure. And if you come with it in an open mind, you will appreciate the good news more. Okay. Now, when, we, when it comes to the good news or the everlasting gospel, the last commission of Jesus, what was the last command of Jesus in Matthew 28, 19, and 20? How does it go? Okay, the regular, the regular, uh, the regular translation says, go ye therefore into all the world, I go, go ye there and preach the gospel. Uh, but the real translation is, as you go, make disciples. You follow? The, the verb in Matthew 8, 28, 19, and 20 is not go. That's why a lot of people who, who understand Matthew 28, 19, 20 in terms of go understands the Gospel Commission in terms of mission. In other words, you have to go. That is the command that you have to go and spread the Gospel. But really, the emphasis of the verb in Matthew 28, 19 is not go, but make disciples. So Jesus is saying, I'm leaving you now, but after I go to heaven, I'll give you my Holy Spirit. And my Holy Spirit will enable you to make disciples as you go along the way. Okay? So the whole idea of making disciples is uh, foundational. Okay? It's essential to the preaching of the gospel and to salvation. Why is it essential? Really? You do not indoctrinate somebody in an evangelistic crusade, have them know the doctrines, and that's it. That's why a lot of them do not last. Why? Because instead of just preaching doctrine, you must make disciples of people. You get the point. And making a disciple is more than just standing there for about three weeks preaching the doctrines and having them believe what the doctrine says. Making a disciple is enlisting people into the school and into the kingdom of Jesus Christ. And we, that's what we will study, uh, we will study the whole quarter. That's why the topic is discipleship. Thank you for my Santa Claus, I just turned my back. <laughs> Cleo gave me this book. The discipleship, the discipleship is, is essential. So, but I was perusing this, looks like several uh, quarters ago, we already dealt with, dealt with discipleship, if you remember. Right? But uh, that quarter dealt more on what discipleship means, you know, the origins, the, you know, the analysis of the concept of discipleship. If you look at the quarterly, that is not what we will consider this quarter. We will not talk about what discipleship is, okay? Instead, the way I look at it, I, I don't know if you have your, look at this, the chapter where it doesn't even have titles. I have a title here. If you have the quarter, did, did they give out quarterlies today? I don't remember. Did anybody receive quarterlies today? Disciple conscription. They gave out quarterlies? 
Okay, well, I, I didn't get one. Get one. <laughs> get one. Anyways, here's the... All right, so you're talking disciples in Scripture, discipling through metaphor, discipleship in prayer, discipling children, discipling the sick, disi discipling the ordinary, uh, Jesus and social outcasts, uh, with the rich and the famous, discipling the powerful, discipling the nations. I'm reading this, and I'm saying, you're not talking about discipleship. He's talking more of the disciplines of a disciple. Are you following? There is a book by Richard Foster. Richard Foster is a Quaker. It's a bestseller. It's entitled, The Lesson of Celebration of Discipline. I have a lot of questions in some of his concepts because... Uh, you know, have you heard of prayer walking? You know where you walk your community and you pray while you walk? And uh, man, I forget the term. I, I, I forget the term that you use for prayer where you go into a matrix. And you eventually go into the center. Uh, a lot of those concepts are taken from Eastern religions. Okay? Uh, you read, when you read the Bible, you don't see the only <laughs> the only evidence that they find for prayer walking is when the children of Israel march around <coughs> the city of Jericho. <laughs> okay, but they they're not praying; <laughs> they're waiting for the walls to come down. Uh, so those are my reservations. There there is there is a great deal of mysticism in the book of Richard Foster. He talks about journaling. He got a lot of disciplines, but what Richard Foster contributed to the Christian community is very valuable. It is valuable in the sense that he's saying, if you are a disciple of Jesus Christ, you must have disciplines in your life. What are the disciplines? The disciplines of Bible study, of prayer, of meditation. All of those are part of becoming a disciple. Why? Because if you do not exercise this, this discipline, you will not turn out to be a good or a real disciple. Okay? Uh, so, where, where do you, where is, the root word for discipline is what? Disciple. You get discipline from disciple. What is, an, what is a synonym of disciple? A synonym of, of disciple is a very common word we use today. It's a student, right? A and yeah, a student or a follower. And that, 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 uh, we will go to that in a little bit. But a student basically has a teacher. That's why the gospel commissioned them, teaching them whatsoever I've commanded you. You teach your disciples that you will make. That's what Jesus is trying to say. So basically, you're talking about a disciple, this quarter, exercising disciplines in other to fulfill his role as a student of Jesus Christ. Okay? Now, one of the texts that's very important is Matthew 27, 57. If somebody can read that. I'll give you a background before we go into the scriptures. Matthew 27, 57. Okay. Joseph of Arimathea factors in to the life of Jesus because what did he do? He gave his tomb to Jesus. I remember when we were in the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem. Yeah, that was our, the last leg of our tour in Israel before we went to Palestine, uh, to, to Jordan and Petra. But when we were there, we went to the Via della Rosa, and the end of the Via della Rosa is Calvary. And right by Calvary is the Holy Sepulchre. And of course, our tour guide said, when Jesus died, he had no tomb. They had nowhere to lay them, lay, lay himself. The, the, uh, Jesus didn't even say that. The Son of Man has not even a pillow to lay his head on. Uh, in fact, when he was born, <laughs> there was no one who will take them in. Okay? So it was Joseph of Arimathea that came and donated his tomb, a new tomb to Jesus. Okay? And then there you see there's a slab where they put the spices in the body of Jesus, so to speak, uh, uh, improvised embalming 
And then they carried him several meters later into the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. But Joseph of Arimathea gave his tomb because Joseph, alongside Nicodemus, was a disciple. And the word used there is mateteo. Okay, that's the Greek word for mateteo. The other Greek word that's commonly used is matetes. Matetes is a word that says you learn something. In other words, somebody teaches you a concept, you understand the concept, then you have matetes. You've, you've learned something from what somebody told you. Now, when you go to mateteo, it's more than just learning something, learning a concept or learning a teaching. It involves three things. You will learn a teaching, which is a doctrine. That teaching will be practice in your life. What else? Your life will be dedicated to your master. So here's, here's the brain that goes into the hands and feet for practical application. So you got praxis, you got theory, you got practical application. And life is you got the heart. You become a disciple. Master. You call you the rabbi master, right? Why, why do you call them master? Because when you call somebody master, what are you willing to do? Yeah, just uh, are you just willing to follow? If you're just, when you call somebody master and rabbi, it's very, very heavy implications. I mean, you follow your master all throughout your life. And if need be, you're even willing to lay down your life for your master. That's the concept of discipleship. That's why Matthew, while the Pharisees and the Sadducees and all the rulers of the synagogue were plotting to cover up the resurrection of Jesus, or they were gloating because Jesus is already crucified. Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, who were Pharisees themselves, members of the Sanhedrin, were not ashamed because they were disciples. They followed Jesus Christ. In fact, uh, just as a side note, remember, why did Nicodemus come to Jesus in the evening? A lot of people say he came to Jesus because he was afraid that... Uh, that people will criticize him, his fellow colleagues. Yeah, give, look at you, you got a doctorate degree, you're a member of the Sanhedrin, and, you know, and you're talking to a guy who's not been educated. Uh, that's going to be a, an insult to you. No, you know, that's, that's, that's actually, that's a lot of conjecture. If you follow the context of what has been written, more than likely Nicodemus went to Jesus at night because that was the only time when he was free. During the day, people flocked around him. So he timed it so that he can have a personal conversation with Jesus Christ. And it's amazing that in that personal conversation comes the most loved text in the whole world, which is, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him, you know, you, you know the story. Well, basically, I know Nicodemus was a disciple. He was not only a disciple of the teachings of Jesus. He was a disciple in his conduct. He was also a disciple in his life. So the basic concept of a disciple is not looking for a master so you can learn some concepts and teachings. It is looking for a master so that you can learn here and you can apply what you've learned using your feet and your hands and you can have somebody to dedicate your life to. Okay? Because what does a disciple do when he finds his master? He leaves what he's got. You turn your back on what you're doing. You just follow your master. That's the way it is. That's disciples, okay? So that's a brief background of what discipleship is. Now, here's the point. In order for discipleship to flourish in the life of a Christian, a Christian disciple, there are several disciplines that you need to cultivate. One of the key disciplines is study or Bible study. So what's, what's the role, okay? What, what are the aspects of the Bible in the Christian, in Christian discipleship? Uh, first, 2 Timothy 3, 14 to 17. Go to that passage so we will understand how the Bible comes into play when we mature as disciples. So, 
Somebody read uh, 2 Timothy 3, 14 to 17. Let's read it all the way because there's not a whole lot of verses anyway. So we will process it verse by verse. Come on. But feeble men and impostors will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. That's 2 Timothy 3, 14. Yeah, 2 Timothy. 3, 14. 14 I'm yeah. sorry. <laughs> it's 1 Timothy, uh, my uh, Savior. Uh, yeah, it's 1 Timothy. I'm sorry. Yeah, that's my bad. I think it's First Timothy three fourteen to seventeen. Yeah. Uh, okay. All right. Okay. 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 All right. Continue. I'm sorry. It's my my bad. Go go ahead. Then yeah, I thought I saw that. Okay, go ahead. There's some more. All the way to 17. It is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in the righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, truly equip, equipped for every good work. Okay, this is, this is packed with so much stuff, okay? Mm -hmm. So let's go to what Paul had to say. Remember, Paul is addressing Timothy. Uh, by the way, <laughs> I just want to clarify this. I have no time to discuss this. This is a whole, is a whole article that uh, one writer in Bible.org wrote that people say that Timothy is a disciple of Paul. Right? You always hear that? Yeah. Well, he, 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 he he's, he's, he's treating him as a son, but there are re there's really no relationship. Uh, <laughs> where in the New Testament do you find that Timothy is the disciple of Paul? You don't find it. Okay, he was a co-laborer of Paul, but Paul kind of taught him, but he was not really a disciple. His the concept of disciple and master uh, wasn't really that explicit in among the apostles and the early church. Okay, so regardless, Paul is talking to Timothy. He's, he's, Timothy is one of the younger converts in the church and one of the younger leaders in the church. And Paul wants to train younger members in the church to help out, okay? And nothing is more fulfilling than to see young workers equipped. That's why I was, I was so exhilarated when, when uh, I was in Artacho. Yes, you see these young, these young pastors, you see these young pastors get excited about the gospel. It's already great. But when you have like over a dozen senior theology students from all over the world sitting down listening, it gets to be more exciting, right? Because these are very young people. And I always tell them, guys, you have 30, 40 years ahead of you. Just imagine if you commit to Jesus right now, how much you can accomplish for him. I don't have that kind of years in front of me. You know, I'd be, I'd be really blessed if I can have another 10 or 15, okay? I won't last that long, but you guys will last long. But the fact that you have started committing to knowing the scriptures at your age, there's no limit to what the Spirit can do through you. So that's very exciting. So that's the relationship with Paul and Timothy. Paul was training Timothy. Okay? So he is talking to Timothy here. Okay? It's Paul talking to Timothy. Um, and he says, Continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and now from childhood, Childhood, you have been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ. Okay. The fact that Paul says, continue, what, what does it say there? Continue in what you have learned. Whoops. Learned is a process that the disciple go through, right? Continue in what you have learned. In other words, you have been discipled into Christianity. You have been discipled into the kingdom of God. So continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed. He did not only learn it, he also believed it. Uh, remember, what's the difference between just learning and believing? Is there a difference? There is a difference. The reason why uh, th th uh, th there was a debate between uh, uh, Dinesh D'Souza, and I think Christopher Hitchens, one of the, he died now, but he's one of the four members of the modern apocalypse, because they're the, the leaders of the new atheism. Uh, he said, faith is 
believing something without any reason. <laughs> you, know, you check out your brain, you don't think, because you don't want to think, you just put your faith. And the nasty said, that's not right. Faith, the way it is taught in the scriptures, is believing something based on evidence. Okay, how much do you need to believe? Do you need to believe everything? No, you can't. So he gives a very, very brilliant example. He said, for instance, if I tell you, I have a wife now and I have kids, says Dinesh D'Souza. Before I met, before we got married, I met my wife. And you know, when I saw this very beautiful and, and very attractive lady, I started to gather evidence, okay? <laughs> Will there be enough evidence to compel me to marry her, okay? So I started talking, let's see what kind of grades she has, you know. Uh, look at the social graces, you know. And, and you research the background of the girl, okay. So of course, somebody will tell you, if you're in your right mind, you must do thorough research. Question, will she be a good wife? Okay, let me research that. How do I get evidence that she will be a good wife? I cannot get evidence unless I marry her first, right? Because <laughs> she won't be, well, or somebody else marries her. But <laughs> if that's the case, I cannot marry her anymore. Okay, second. What's there any, do you want to have family? Yes, I want to have family. Is there any evidence that she will be a good mother? Well, it's even more complicated. <laughs> I, don't, I don't even, I don't need to marry her only. I got to have children with her. Can I get evidence for that? I, <laughs> ah, yeah, you can get you can get evidence, Benji, in terms of her capability of becoming a mother. Yeah. But can you get evidence that she will be a good mother? Yeah. It's very different. See, that's why now you're, you're talking into aesthetics and the natural science. You know, uh, so it, it becomes a very absurd. What is he trying to say? You do not need to get all the evidences before you can believe, but you should have sufficient evidence that what you're believing. It's true. Okay, you know what? Yeah, what yeah you know what he said. Yeah, what he said basically is, after getting acquainted with my girlfriend, and we went out, and I look how she behaved, I began to trust her person. I'm not just talking about what she can do. I'm talking about her person. And because I learned to trust her person, I was willing to commit myself before the altar and marry her and spend the rest of my life with her. Did I get all the evidence? No. Because you know what happens? He says, you will accumulate enough evidence to cast your trust on a person. Okay? You won't know what will happen in the future. But that trust and that faith is a bridge to the unknown because you have sufficient evidence to tell you that somehow she will be true in the future to you. Are you following? So you don't become a Christian and a disciple because you've abandoned your reason. You check your brains out, the do out, out by the door and you don't, you believe God because there is no reason. The same holds true for being a disciple. A disciple follows only the Christian faith if he begins to understand the person of Jesus Christ. Are you following? You cannot know all the evidence. In fact, we can never understand everything about God, because if we understand everything about God, He will cease to be God. But is there enough materials in the Bible for you to know that God is trustworthy? Yes, He said, read the Bible. And I'm telling you, if you read the Bible, I will help you understand that God is trustworthy. And because God is trustworthy, you can cast your faith, cast your trust in Him. That's what it's trying to say. So, how do you know that? Two things. The first is through revelation. You look at the first part of verse 15. And how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings. What are the sacred writings? What was the purpose of the sacred writings? What was Paul referring to here? He's referring to the scriptures. In this particular case, the Old Testament. Okay? Okay? Because Paul only had the Old Testament as his Bible. Remember, there was no New Testament yet. So somebody turned to Hebrews. This will help us understand what was in the mind of Paul. Hebrews 1, I think Hebrews 1, 1 and 2. Hebrews 
come in those with spoken tongues as to the powers by the prophets. For in this last day spoken to us by his son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. Okay. What is being conveyed here by the author of the book of Hebrews? Saying, God spoke. How did he speak? Who are the prophets? The prophets nothing more than the authors of the writers of the Old Testament. In other words, if I may, the, the transitive closure, we're saying, hey, God spoke through the Bible. Okay? In times past, God spoke through the Bible. But, what does it say? Continue. In these last days, He's spoken through His Son. Oh, he's so beautiful. That's why we spent 13 Sabbaths on the sanctuary. What's the purpose of the sanctuary? Remember, I studied this morning, Exodus 25, 8. Let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. Uh, John 1, 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. What's the meaning of that? Because the purpose of the sanctuary is to have God's presence among his people, right? In order, so in order for his people to know who he is. But it's very difficult to know who he is. Because he is so transcendent. People were so scared. Remember when, when God came down Mount Sinai? Remember that story? And it was so powerful when he started speaking. The children of Israel said, no, 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 no. Don't let him come down again. You talk to him. <laughs> Moses, you talk to him because we will die the next time we listen to God. Okay? He's a consuming fire. You know, his majesty and glory is, will, will, will consume sinners like us. So what happened then? Because, the, because God is a consuming fire. God said, I'll find a way to communicate to you. First attempt that he did was to give you the scriptures. And by reading the Bible, I will reveal myself through human words, human language, so you can understand. So they started reading the Bible. But I promise you, I will give you more than just human words. Because in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. And the Word became blessed. My words will actually assume a human person, a, 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 human, a human being in human form, you will see me dwell with you in the person of my son. Therefore, the primary purpose of the Bible is a revelation of who God is. How is he revealed? He is revealed in Jesus Christ. I got to understand this. Uh, and I, I want to give this as a warning. And it's one of the lessons you must emphasize in your classes this coming Sabbath. How many of you have heard people, particularly our Pentecostal brothers and sisters, that say, you know, God told me to be here today. Have you heard them <laughs> say that? <laughs> they, they, you know, it's, it's almost like they have like a, a hotline to heaven. And, and it's almost like they're one up on you. They know more of God than you, right? So <laughs> I remember my favorite story. Elder Steve Brown was talking about... Uh, uh, a, a middle-aged lady in their church who was dying to have a husband. And there was a new convert, a young man, to the church. And you know what the strategy of the woman was? She approaches this young man and told this young man, you know what? God told me that we should be married. <laughs> so so he, she... She trickles into the pastor study of uh, Pastor Steve Brown in this church. And he said, uh, Reverend Brown, God told me that I should marry this gentleman. <laughs> and this, this gentleman was already blushing. What can he do? He's a new Christian. And this lady is saying that God told her something, you know, which obviously he didn't know. So, of course, uh, uh, Steve Brown started chuckling inside him. He did not show it. <laughs> he wanted to insult the woman. And then before he can say anything, the woman continued and said, And you know, God also told me that we should get married in July. <laughs> he put, there, was a, there was a time, there was a date already. And then uh, Steve Brown said, uh, Sister, I think we have a problem. Because God also told me that I should be in Los Angeles in July. I will have to have a conference there. <laughs> I wonder who's the true God <laughs> telling us to do something. And then you look at the gentleman and start winking his eyes. <laughs> you know what I'm trying to say? There is a very big danger today because of, you've heard this, like word of wisdom. You've heard this in the, the gifts of the prophets. They think, oh, you know, Karnak, ooh, 
God has spoken to me. I had a dream. I do this. And people are saying, God spoke to me. And because God spoke to me, you must listen to what I say. What do you say about those comments? How can you be sure that what you're saying came from God? The answer is on the board. You will only be sure that what you're saying is from God if it's based on the scriptures. And one of the most exasperating things that happens, particularly within the context of Adventism, is we have not been taught to study the Bible for itself. A lot of times our approach to the Bible is what we call, remember this term? I see Jesus as opposed to exegesis. What's the difference between the two? Exegesis is getting the truth out of, that's why it's act. Okay, out of the Bible. I see Jesus is reading the truth into the Bible. What's, what do I mean by that? You don't go to the Bible to make it say what you want this to say. That's I see Jesus. Okay? Uh, so you take a liking to a whole lot of girls and you like women and you want to have more than one woman in your life. So you look for a text in the Bible. That tells you that Solomon has 700 wives and 300 concubines. Stuff becomes your favorite text. That's I see Jesus. Because you like a lot of women, you want to justify your conduct, you look for a text to support what you have in your head. That's an extreme example. Okay? But when the Bible says, anyone who follows me must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me, if you want to become my disciple, that may not be very attractive to you. But actually, Jesus said, regardless of whether you like it or not, if that's what the Bible says, you must take the revelation of God. Okay, let's stretch it some more. Let's apply it some more. Remember the story between Rick Warren and Joel Austin, right? Joel Austin is probably pastor. one of the largest congregations in the United States. And Joel Austin basically just saying, oh, I want to preach positive. All my messages must be positive. I, I don't want to mention anything about judgment, about hell, you know, because that will be negative to my congregation. So Rick Warren got so mad, the author of the 40 Days to Purpose Driven Life. And you know what Rick Warren said? He said, if in my study I read about hell, my congregation will hear about hell the coming weekend I'm going to preach. Because I have no choice. If I'm a preacher of God's word, if I'm a disciple of God's word, I only preach what God says, even if I don't like it. That's the point. That's why we, we say, how in the world can we have revival and reformation in the church? You don't have revival and reformation through emotions. Revival and reformation comes through obedience to what God has revealed. And if people are willing to exegete, go into the Bible and out of the Bible have humility and teachability to follow what God says, then maybe some things will change. So it's not so difficult to process this. Let's apply this. You go to your classes this coming Sabbath, and somebody talks to you, and they, they try to introduce a doctrine to you which you do not understand. It's fairly novel to you. What's the best question to ask? Uh, where in the Bible did you find that, right? Uh, that's, very, that's a very courteous answer. If you really want to, you know, do you have any Bible text that, that supports what you're trying to say? What are you basically saying? Hey! Make me understand that what you're telling me is a revelation from God. And that it's really coming from God. How do we know that it's coming from God if it comes from the Bible? Okay? So it is important for the disciple of Jesus in order for him to grow to understand who God is. Because the nature of the disciple is to be like his master or to be like God or to be like Jesus Christ. How do you become like Jesus Christ? To know more about Jesus Christ. How do you know more about Jesus Christ? Because it was revealed in scriptures okay okay I hope that's clear first purpose of the Bible is to revelation the purpose of the Bible and disciples is revelation without revelation you will not know the teachings about God you will have nobody to follow you have nobody to emulate okay your life will not exercise the conduct in accordance with the will of God there's another purpose the last part of verse 15 what does it say it is able to make you 
wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Okay, I have a I have favorite text for this. Uh, John 5, 39 and 40. We'll just repeat this. You know, I know you guys memorize some of this. It says, you search the scriptures for it, you think in them you have eternal life. And all of them points to me. Yet you don't want to come to me in order to have life. So a lot of people have used this. This is another example of ICG's. Jesus. I see Jesus says, there you go, there you go, there you go. Read the Bible. It says, search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. You see, how do you have eternal life? By searching the scriptures. Or so you study the Bible, you think by studying the Bible you'll be saved. Is that what the text is trying to say? No. The text is not saying that. The text is not a command. It is not commanding you to read the Bible. In fact, it is a review. What is Jesus saying? You are searching and searching the Bible because by searching the Bible you think you can have eternal life. But all of this Bible points to me, and yet you don't want to accept me. That's what it's trying to say. You just read the context, and you understood that it's wrong to read into that Bible, make it read it into the text as a command. That is not what the text is saying. What the text is saying is, if you fail to see Jesus in reading the Bible, you have missed the point. In other words, yes, you may be good in the revelation of God and understand His will and understand all the doctrines that He gives in the Bible. But if the doctrine doesn't point you to redemption that is available in Jesus Christ, it has been an exercise in futility for what you've done. Uh, several texts that I'd like to give you here is, I think it's John 20, 30, and 31. Somebody read that. John 20, 30, and 31. Thirty and thirty one. Mm -hmm. Wow. You've heard of the concept of the synoptic gospels, right? They 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 call it the synoptic gospel, Mark Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. The synopsis, uh, you know, it's synchronized in the same root word, sin. They have very common, common uh, passages, common stories, you know, common uh, historical uh, na narratives you find in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. When you go to John, it is not part of the synoptics because a big part of the Gospel of John is dedicated to the passion of Jesus Christ. You follow? You, you know, he, he talks about some, a little, very little parable, some miracles, but what John spends his book, writing his book on, is the closing days of Christ's ministry. Because for him, the most important thing of Christ's life was Calvary and what he did to save mankind. And what did he say? There are so many things I could have written as part of this book, right? You read that there. In fact, if you read the last part of John, I suppose not even the whole world can contain if all the materials that I can read, can write about, him talk about John 21. But he's saying in John 20, but all of these have been written for what purpose? That you may believe that Jesus is Christ and that by believing, you will be saved. The purpose of the Bible is for the disciple to learn who is God and what kind of God he is. And once you've learned who God is and what kind of God he is, he then takes you to his redemption plan and how he can save you from your sins. This is the first steps of a disciple. You must understand who God is and you must understand that God came to save us from our sins to redemption, to ours purpose of the Bible is revelation and redemption. Uh, how often do you exercise this? Remember, one of my favorite texts is Colossians 2.6. Colossians 2.6. As ye have therefore received him, Jesus Christ, so walk ye in him. How do you walk in him? The way you receive him. In other words, you got to keep on coming back to the foot of the cross. You got to keep on coming back to what God has done for you in Jesus Christ. That's the only way you can grow as a disciple. Because that's the impetus, that's the motivation for your life. You know, if you don't go back to the cross, you might try to be good. But what's the purpose, what's the motivation of your being good? 
That's the love of God. Maybe you're trying to gain brownie points. It will mess up your motivation. So every day as a disciple, if you want to mature, you must go back to God's revelation in Jesus Christ. And now he has saved you in him. Okay? Now, that's why I love this passage. There's so much balance in this passage. Uh, the gospel is presented, and now he's saying the Bible is profitable. There's a profit in reading the Bible. What's the profit in reading the Bible? Four basic profits that you find in the Bible, says Paul. It is profitable for teaching or doctrine. It's profitable for reproof, profitable for correction. It's possible, profitable for training or instruction. What's doctrine and teaching? You know, I agree wholeheartedly if we say in the church, if you only know the doctrine and the doctrine doesn't change your life, it's useless. I agree wholeheartedly there. But there's a danger when you always say that. You might cast an impression that doctrine is not important. Are you following me? So people stop studying doctrine. Question, they start to live their lives without doctrine. What happens to that kind of life? Oh, boy. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know it's, it's almost like, here's an extreme example, but maybe through exaggeration you'll understand what I mean. You know, I said, I, I'm glad I saw Chris today, okay? Chris is in the armed forces. One of the things that's very difficult if you're on the ground is to navigate the minefield, right? <laughs> you make one mistake, you're dead, right? Step on that one, mine's going to explode, you think. Okay, so there's a minefield in front of you, and your commandant is saying, okay, here's the layout, guys, and here are the instructions in order for you to be able to navigate this without blowing yourself up. You listen to me very closely, because if you don't listen, it will be a matter of life and death. Okay, so you learn all the guidelines, and you know, and you got, you got to learn all the instructions and all the strategies that you need to apply in order for you to get to the other end, passing that minefield. But you do not cross the minefield. Did it, did it do you any good? No, it did not do you any good, because you learned it, but you, didn't, you, you weren't able to cross the minefield. You did not continue with the battle plan. Okay, that's one problem. The second problem is, you tell your commandant, come on, I want to die for my country. I don't need your instructions. I will just navigate the minefield. What happens to you? You blow up and you die. That's an extreme example, but that's what I'm trying to say. And I'm very, very concerned about this because I always hear this. I mean, not only in other places. I hear that in the church. They always say, oh, doctrine, 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 but there's no life. Yes, I agree with you. If there's no change in your life and you have to study doctrine, then your study is useless. But if you're trying to live life without knowing the doctrine, that is more dangerous because you think that you are saved when in fact you're not. You're behaving, you become a behaviorist, you try to be good without the right reasons. Um, I, I, I feel very strongly about this because this, it is my conviction that if the only way you can really be revived is to go back to God because you cannot spend time with the Bible without being changed. You know, you know what I'm trying to say? If people will learn to spend more time with the Bible and read of the Bible, that's the only way God can communicate with you and only God can transform you. Are you following me? And the only way God can transform you is through His Word. And you spend time with your Word, with His Word, then it's going to be. That's why it is very important. It is profitable for teaching. Why is it, what, why is it important to be taught? Um, I am not here to say anything about politics, okay? And I'm not here to talk about Obamacare, okay? You've heard me say about this before. Um, you heard me mention about uh, Michai and their practice, right? Um, let me just repeat for you guys who were not here. I visited Michai towards the, I mean, a few weeks ago just to have my, my periodic checkup. And the head of their practice, he died. He had a heart attack. He thought uh, he was okay because he was a cardiologist. <laughs> yeah. It's not it's fairly young. And then, you know, so but of course, it, then Mitchell was saying, well, he, he thought he was a superman. He knew everything. In, he was a cardiologist. And he was eating out every day. Mm -hmm. uh, and then he, he grew. And, you know, of course, Mitchell ethically was saying, I, I cannot tell him anything. I mean, he, can't, he has his own life. I don't want to dictate, you know. And, and 
But I mean, that was the whole, that was on the whole reason. And we got to talk. <laughs> That's the way I visit me, Chai. We don't talk about my blood pressure so much. <laughs> we talk about church, <laughs> we talk about stuff. And then um, turns out their practice has been absorbed by the hospital because of Obamacare. And this guy spent 30 years building the practice. And of course, they put a lot of stress on him, right? They're, they, they're not the big group. And for you to lose your practice and, and all sorts of stuff, okay, and I don't want to expand there some more. And then Michai goes and saying, Bing, I'm seeing it. I, I'm reading it from the Bible. And it's only now that I'm beginning to see how people will control, not only people, they will control governments and they will control systems. So he, 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 Michai is saying, you know, Bing, as my patient, you know, I'm obligated to you. I got to run periodic tests that, that I deem necessary for you to be in good health, to check your good health. But what if the government says you don't need to run those checks anymore? You can go ahead and just do some checks. What are you doing? It's systematic euthanasia, you know what I mean? It, it, it's getting rid of people. I mean, I have a friend in, in, in Toronto who is one of the more uh, the leading physicians. He's a Filipino physician. He's saying, he told me, oh, it's socialized medicine in Toronto. You know what they do in Toronto? They just killed all their, all their folks. How do they kill them? They put them in the, the bottom of the list for surgery. Right? They just give them palliative medicine. And they just expect, expect them to die. But you know, and then I can't I can forget this. Michan was saying, but people are not aware of this. This is happening to them. And control is happening. You don't even see them. How in the world can you survive if you're part of a mass, you know? It's almost like a brainwashing and mask me without telling. The only way to survive is to know the truth. You go back to knowing the truth. And I cannot overemphasize this, okay? And I hear this again, okay? I believe this, that love is important, okay? I don't want to be mean-spirited here, okay? But I, I saw the posting in Facebook. They said that... Uh, I thought, what's the name of the current Pope? Pope Francis, okay. I heard that Pope Francis is a great Pope. And I didn't realize this until I saw pictures. He showed 10 pictures of what Pope Francis did. He hugged an elephant man. You know what an elephant man is, right? You should see that expression, grotesque, a monster. But he hugged this elephant man. He washed the feet of the relics and kissed the feet. You see the Pope. You know. There were ten very moving acts that the Pope did. Okay, I don't want to be mean spirited, okay? If I get to impress you because of I'm so how humanitarian I am, you know, look at how much I gave to Typhoon Yolanda. You know how much I sacrificed to Typhoon Yolanda. And you kind of, you kind of, you, you kind of, you, 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 you kind of you you trust me? You know, like, 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 like the church of the city of Baga, some man low body, you know. You know. Now, if, if, I, if, if, if I get your trust because I, I'm so good, I'm so loving, and you start believing me, and I tell you something that's not consistent with the revelation of God, how easy will you believe me? I hope you're getting my point. It is very dangerous if you make the direction of your life based on what you see on other people and how impressive they are. Because if you do that, one of these days, those people can fail you because not nobody's perfect in this world. The only, the only way to realize that you are guided into the truth is to find the revelation of God. So maybe that's enough for <laughs> my teaching. But you know how I feel. <laughs> There are very, very subtle risks that we run uh, 
We had a very, we had a very, very meaningful prayer meeting last Wednesday. You know, Ray came from the Philippines and and he read my posting in the. I posted it in the in the in Facebook. He read the story of how this family went into a restaurant, into a diner, and there was a homeless man who started uh, playing with their kid. And, and the kid took a liking to the man. You know, the, the kid was so innocent. He didn't care that the man stunk. Because, <laughs> the, you know, you, I don't care. You don't know how much, you know, how a homeless man smells. You know, he was a smelly man. He was like disheveled clothing. And, you know, it's just, but uh, the kid was having a good time. You know, it was just the teasing. And how you buddy, you know, and I talk. And then, and finally the kid goes like this. And then the homeless man takes the kid into his arms. And then it ended by saying, oh, God, forgive me. Forgive me for not seeing people the way my kid sees people. Uh, and then he said, reminds me that during the first Christmas, Father in heaven, gave his son to a world just like the homeless man. Are you willing to let a homeless man borrow your son for a while? Very powerful. But during our discussion, and Rufo and remember this, I, I can still go over that prayer meeting. It was a very beautiful prayer meeting we had. I said, uh, um, you always say, oh my, we got problems with young adults. As soon as they graduate from high school, they don't go to church anymore. Oh, we got problems with a lot of our young people. You know, what will we do? You know why they leave? Oh, they found it. oh, the way the reason why they leave is they find a lot of hypocrites in the church. And you hear this, right? And they, they find oh, and the reason why they leave is church is boring. You know, I beg to disagree. And we brought this up during the prayer meeting. The reason why they leave is they've never been disciples. They've never learned to pray. They've never learned to commune with God. But if they learn to pray in church and they've learned to grow in his word, regardless of what will happen in their lives, they will not leave. So that's why I, I feel very strongly and I, I become very passionate when I talk about this. Yes, I understand doctrine without practice is useless. But the opposite of that is very, very dangerous as well. If you practice without doctrine. And what's very, very difficult, as you know this, we studied Revelation, we studied Daniel. In the last days, it will not just be a deception person to person. It will be a systemic deception by corp institutions, by entire governments. They will deceive you. How alone can you stand? Only to the right teacher. Only the minds that have been fortified by the scriptures can be able to stand the wiles of the devil in the last days. I mean, you're talking Michai, who's a very intelligent guy. You're talking about a bunch of cardiologists who got subsumed into a system. And because of the manipulation of the system, they didn't even realize that somehow the system is playing games with them. That will happen one of these days. And that will not happen only in medicine. That will happen in the church. And once it happens in the church, how do you know whether you're deceived or not? The only way you can stand firm is if you know the revelation of God. That's why the Bible is profitable for teaching, to fortify your minds and to defend you and protect you and shield you from the deceptions of the enemy in the last days. More than that, the Bible is also important for reproof. Like the sermon this morning, it's very difficult to say, Forgive me, I messed up, I'm sorry. How many of you have been reproved by the Bible? You know, that has happened to me. And I, I read the Bible, and once in a while, I listen to Erwin Lutzer. Erwin Lutzer is a terrific pastor, a pastor of Moody Memorial Church. And sometimes when he preaches, he gets to apply the Bible. <laughs> you feel like after you get out of the, your car, 
You want to follow what the Bible is trying to say. Because you did the boo-boo. You did something wrong. And you wanted to make it clear. You've been reproof. Basically, reproof tells you, hey, what you did was wrong, right? And if you are really, if you are a true friend, you do not uh, oil your, you know, your, your, your <laughs> this guy and not tell him the truth. Oh, it's okay. If it's not okay, <laughs> if you're a true friend, you got to tell it like it is. That's why I love, you know, as, as blunt as Lourdes can be sometimes. Lourdes will come to you and tell you, oh, you know, you try to sing, but you cannot sing. <laughs> she tells you that because I'm not telling this because I hate you. In fact, I love you. The reason why I'm telling this to you is because if I don't tell you, nobody else will tell you. And maybe if I tell you, you can do something about it and you'll have a better life. That's reproof. They are reproof, reproved by the Bible, not for God to watch our every move and to give us a hard time but because he's a true friend. When we do something wrong, he tells us that it's wrong. Okay? Uh, I don't know how, of you, how many of you are computer savvy, if you know how to use the computer. And, you know, and, and Eden, because she accepted the church clerkship, clerkship of the church board, had to learn computers. So I started teaching her to use the word processor, how to copy files and do stuff at home. What do I do if she gets frustrated because things are not working? I gotta tell her, you're doing something wrong, right? You're not supposed to put your mouse there. You're not supposed to click there. You gotta go here and do it. What am I trying to do? Am I giving her a hard time and telling her that she doesn't know what she's doing? No. I'm doing it for her so that she can do what she needs to do. And that's what the Bible is. Now, Aside from just reproving, the nice thing about the Bible, it, it will all also correct you. He will not only tell you that what you're doing is wrong, he will tell you the correct way to do it. Isn't that cool? A true friend will not just criticize you. A true friend will suggest how to correct your mistake. And that's what the Bible does. When the Bible says, um, love your enemies, Kind of hard, huh? <laughs> Jesus. How in the world? You know, I like reading the Gospels, but when I read Matthew 5, 44 to 48, and say, love your enemies. You know, the only way to Christian maturity is to love your enemies. And I go to church, and I see him. I see her. It's impossible. <laughs> Why? Because I just cannot love her. How can you know? You, you cannot say sorry. You cannot say. Well, when you read the Bible, you say, hey, that's wrong. What you're doing is wrong. You know, the only way to correct it is to go to the guy and say, I'm sorry. I don't have to tell you the details. I mean, it has happened to me. And I'm, I'm saying, uh, this is one of the suggestions. You know what the Bible suggests? If somebody, what do you need to do to your enemy? Pray for those, you know, those who, who mistreat you. So when I, you know, it's a few instances in the church that happen. That's why part of my prayer list, I have a very long prayer list every day. Part of my prayer list are those enemies, <laughs> okay? And you know what happens when I pray for them? It helps me follow the Bible. It becomes very easy. In fact, uh, uh, I had things happen where I really was convicted. I had to go and pay a surprise visit and talk to this guy. And man, I was out of line. Sorry, man. It wasn't easy. But because... I got reproof and I was corrected. I go back to God's grace and I followed what the scripture said. I'm better off with it. You wouldn't believe how beautiful the smile is from that guy. <laughs> you know what I'm trying to say? After you've gone through the reconciliation process and followed what the Bible said. And you listen to some of the sermons of Erwin Lutzer. There are so many practical guidelines. He was saying in one of his sermons, there were members of his church who stole before. They never been caught. <laughs> they had to confess. <laughs> what if they, you know, there are repercussions for your decision. But they say, if you follow the scriptures, and that is the correction, it will help you live a better life. And then important is instruction or training. What's the meaning of training and instruction? Yes, fine. I will tell you how it is done. I will tell you that you're, you're doing it wrong. 
I will correct what you're doing wrong. And you know what else you will do? I will train you <laughs> to correct what you're doing wrong based on the true doctrine that I give you. It's very beautiful. I mean, that's why this is so packed with meaning. The prophet of the Bible is teaching reproof, correction, and training. Okay? Go to the last part. What's it say? What's the, what's the end result? Verse 17. That the men of God may be what? Okay, the one of the translations is complete. Any other translations that you have? Equip? One el anyone else? Starts with the C2. The actual translation, if you go to the original word, is competent. Okay, so we l let's read it. It says, uh, that the men of God may be competent. What's the meaning of competent? You know what it means to be a competent worker? Okay, yes. <laughs> competent is not incompetent. <laughs> okay. What is incompetent? It, let's, let's say it in Filipino. Filipino is easier. Naaasahan. Right? Or trustworthy. Because it's not, I, can, I can leave, you know, I always say this. You know, I remember when I had the group. One of the things that we did in our group at the office was to make sure everybody, every Monday morning we had the status report, and I told everybody, this is what happened over the weekend. Is this the way we resolve the problem? So there were four of us in the group. And each one of us, if somebody takes a vacation, is confident that we can leave the group because there's someone in the group who knows how to solve the problems. Everybody has been competent in solving the problem. That's what it's trying to say here. If you follow the prophet of the Bible, okay, from the grace of God all the way here, he will give you proficiency. You will be competent. You will be complete. You will be competent in doing what? What's the last part? Equip for every good works so that you'll be productive. The only way to be productive in God's kingdom is to gain proficiency, be competent through the scriptures. And then once you become competent, you become equipped through the scriptures, what then happens? You will be productive in God's kingdom. I remember in one of the churches that I pastored when I had 12 <laughs> churches in Southern Nevada, Asia District, one of the elders, you know, his, his work was just a carpenter, and he couldn't really pay money to go to send to our church school. It's a very, very expensive tuition. So instead of sending his kid to school right away, he taught his kid. Home study, home school. <laughs> it was still a long time ago. But you know how he taught his kid? He taught him the Bible. And he taught the kid how to read the Bible and how to memorize the Bible. You know how, what happened to the kid when he went to school? Good. Well, not only good memory, man. He was a very sharp kid. I'm not saying, you know, you, you'll ace your exam if you read the Bible. <laughs> but all I'm trying to say is the fear of the Lord <laughs> the beginning of wisdom and if you make God first you will be proficient you will be competent you will be productive that's the productivity of the scripture um, I can never overemphasize it um, I remember one of the very popular professors of Andrews was saying he was pursuing his doctoral degree and according to him he said I have been convicted throughout my whole life that I need the daily exercise. You know, after reading this in my, my, my discipleship, my maturity in the Christian life, the, I've read in the Bible based on what the Lord has tell, told me to take care of my body and I need to exercise. So what I've been doing, I've been jogging at least an hour a day. Turns out my comprehensives was upon me. You know, <laughs> the comprehensives was there. He needs to study to defend his dissertation and you know, it passes comprehensive. And he said, if I spend one hour in jogging, that will be a lot of time to waste. That will be wasted time. I won't be able to study. You know what he did? He jogged anyways. In obedience to the way he has been led in his readings of the scriptures. Guess what happened? He absorbed more <laughs> in the span of time after he jogged. And, you know, Chris can explain to you what happens when you jog and you, you, you stimulate the blood flow in your body and you become, you know, concentration increases. He was faithful. <laughs> I'm trying to say. The Bible, a moment he teaches you, reproves you, corrects you, and trains you, he will complete you. And when he completes you, you can become really productive. And when that happens, you cannot say, I did it. 
And you did not do it. Who equipped you to do it? It was God through his word. And how did he do it? He revealed it to you. And he gave you his grace. So that you can go to his teaching, reproof, correction, and training. He makes you proficient. And then you become a productive disciple in his kingdom. Very potent passage. But I really like this passage. If you want to start discipleship and understand the role of the Bible in discipleship. 2 Timothy 3, 14 to 17 will tell you a whole lot. So that's the way we start our quarter in discipleship. Look at the scriptures and how important it is. Okay. I have one question. I know you have some, some of you have questions, but I have one very important question. If Jesus is the center of the Bible, how do you study the Bible centered in Jesus Christ? Let me suggest something, a method that I do. Whenever you open the Bible, you have to ask yourself, as I read this passage, what does it say about Jesus Christ? That's not a bad question to ask. I'm very excited. I hope you pray for me because uh, Stacy and his cousins requested to have a Bible study every Friday night, and a bunch of them. And Whenever he says, Uncle Ving, you want to learn the Bible? You don't know where to begin. Okay. And when we open the Bible, we don't know where to continue. <laughs> How do you do? You talk about Jesus in the Bible. And if you talk about Jesus in the Bible, people will get acquainted to who Jesus is, and Jesus will take care of them. What am I trying to say? The bottom line is when you read the Bible, it must be a way to understand Jesus more. Because if you don't, then you have failed in studying the scriptures. All of these scriptures point to me. Is it possible to study the Bible and miss Jesus Christ? I just remember my story about that one guy who went to Israel and looked for an old Jewish man. They claimed that this guy can memorize the Old Testament from Genesis 1 to Malachi in the original language, okay? So this researcher sat down and listened to this old man. And over after a little over two hours, the old man <coughs> repeated from memory in the original Hebrew, Genesis 1-1 to Malachi, flawlessly. And you know how they do it, right? Because it, it, it's oral tradition. They didn't write it. You know, they transferred it orally. How they did do it through oral tradition? They put them into songs. They sang it. That's why you go to Jewish synagogue, we, we begin the Jew, Jewish funeral, they sang the scriptures. And you know, it's so easy to sing the scriptures. And you know, kids can sing the scriptures, they don't even know what they're singing, right? And that's, that's oral tradition, you keep on saying, but this guy was able to do it from Genesis 1, 1 to Malachi. He, start, he repeated the Old Testament from memory. You know what's interesting? That Jew was an atheist. <laughs> okay, well, I, 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 yeah, I got about, about 60, 70% in America that they claim that they're born again, but they don't care to pray, and they don't care to read the Bible. I mean, profession is one thing, okay, conviction is something else. Okay, yeah, I can, I'm a Jew in nationality, right? I mean, we, we got, we had that tour guide, he was not talking about the Bible lands, <laughs> what, he was talking about Jew Jewish culture. I mean, not after Jewish culture. We're talking about making the Bible come alive as we go to Israel. So you can be a Jew from a national nationality and cultural standpoint, but you may not be a Jew biblically. But all I'm trying to say is you can read the Bible and miss Jesus Christ altogether. That's the bottom line. And if you do that, you are not on your way to be a disciple. But the bottom line, again, in my study of the first lesson of this quarter, without the Bible, it is impossible to mature as a disciple. In fact, you cannot be a disciple without the Bible. Because what does the Bible say in Romans 10? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The only way you can have faith is if the word of God prompts you and changes your heart so that you can believe in Him. That's how important the Bible is. And once you believe in Him, the Bible will guide you. It will be profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction and training so that you can be proficient and you can be productive in the kingdom of God. Right, any questions? Yeah, Elsa. Um, 
Okay, Elsa is saying, uh, if that wasn't probably her question, it was a, it was a comment that you, before you read the Bible, you must pray first. Why is it important? And there, we will spend, I think that's a third lesson about discipleship and prayer. We talk about prayer as one of the disciplines. But the bottom line is, why is it important to pray to God before you read the Bible? Oh, I remember. How many of you guys been to public school here? Anybody who went to public school? In a, since I grew up in, from my kindergarten all the way to my grad, graduation in college, I grew up in an Adventist school. So I'm so used to starting a class with prayer. We never, never start a class without the teacher praying first. I don't know if that's still happening. Okay, I wish that happens again. Okay? In fact, there was a time when you go to our hospitals before any surgery, before anything happens, the doctors pray for the patient. Of course, there are now some government re regulations that complicates that, but I hope that happens again because you will make a difference when you do that. But all I'm trying to say is I've been to a public school. You know, and when I went to computers, I started en enrolling in some classes and courses that is not part of a Christian school system. And we just dive into the materials, right? After diving in the material, you go to this. I felt weird. How can you study without talking to God first? That, that, was, that was my upbringing. And, and we will study that we go to prayer. It is important for you to ask the leadings of God before you open the Word. Because you're not reading a secular book. You're reading His revelation. And remember, there are two key components. The Bible was inspired, right? Right? So through inspiration, God gave the scriptures. How do we understand the Bible? There is another term that Bible teachers use. They call it illumination. <coughs> illumination is different from inspiration. Inspiration was the leadings of the Holy Spirit to the writers of the Bible. Okay? We cannot be inspired because only the writers of the Bible were inspired. If you talk about inspired of singing a song, that is a secular inspiration. True spiritual inspiration was only given to the writers of the scriptures, okay? But can we understand the Bible today? Yes. <coughs> Who did God give to lead us, guide us into all truth? It's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit allows us to understand it through His, what we call illumination. The Holy Spirit illumines what God has inspired. And how does the Holy Spirit do that? The only way the Holy Spirit can do that is if you submit in humility and teachability to God first. How do you do that? You do that in prayer. How do you open the Bible? You open the Bible and tell God, God, I don't know what you want to tell me, but please <coughs> reveal yourself to me through your word and let me open your word and talk to me and guide me today, whether it's a teaching, a reproof, a correction, or instruction. Talk to me, Lord, because without you, I cannot understand this. Um, how many of you hate math here, mathematics. So you know, okay, wow, everybody here loves math. <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> yeah, you're something else. Uh, okay. <laughs> no, I'm not talking about figure skates. I'm talking about literal liking. That's one of my favorite subjects. Uh, math was my... Uh, all right, you like multipli the multiplication tables, right? You like that, Miss. So, uh, I had, a, I had a classmate in school who was a very good preacher, but he didn't like math. And once you start learning, we, we took Greek together, you know? And you know when you learn a language, the way we learned it before is through, through conju conjugation, you know, how you conjugate the verbs, and now the clensions, the nouns, and that kind of stuff, you know, you know, is, was, being, beautiful, more beautiful, more, you do that, you know? Uh, you do the conjugation in Greek, and if you love math, it's easy. Because what do you do? On conjugations are just patterns, right? They're patterns. And declensions are just patterns. And mathematics is nothing more than patterns. And they're saying that in, in, in computers, you ne need to be a good calculator. That's not true. To be a good computer technician and a good computer developer, you must just have good sense for patterns. You know, and when you see the patterns and the consistency, you can program. That's the way it programs. You program patterns, not so much, so much mathematics. So <laughs> All men in the middle of the, the class, I, I really respected this guy. I looked up to him because 
Yeah, I learned a lot from him. You know, he's one of the more senior theology students. He came to me and told me, Dean, can you teach me Greek? <laughs> and I found out the reason why, why he couldn't understand the lesson. He hated conjugation. <laughs> like I had to tell them, you cannot learn Greek if you hate conjugation. <laughs> you got to learn the patterns. Once you see the pattern, it a it's a lot easier. Uh, that's why some once in a while when our kids are having a problem in school, we hire what we call a, a tutor. Why do you hire a tutor? Because the kid cannot learn from the teacher. <laughs> you need a tutor to help the kid learn from the teacher. Okay. And that's the point of the scriptures as well. You cannot just read the Bible and understand it. You need the tutor. The tutor is the Holy Spirit well, to lead you. Reading the Bible, which version is going oh, that's a good question. That's a very good question. That's a very good question. Yes. Okay. Remember, the apocrypha is not part of the canon. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the su uh, apocrypha is pseudepigrapha. Yes. And we're not saying they don't have value. They have historical value, but they're not inspired. In other words, they cannot be the basis for doctrine and practice. Only the canon of 66 books are. Okay, all I'm trying to say is how, how uh, the question is, what version do you want to read? The answer to have is as many as you can read. So I do not believe in, yeah. I'm in conversation with somebody in, the, in Facebook right now. We're talking about ICGs and ICGs. And he says he, he goes through all the possible translations of the Bible. Because he didn't take Greek. He didn't, he didn't take uh, Hebrew. You know what I suggest to you? You look for in the internet for a word study Bible. You know what the word study Bible means? The word study Bible will give you the Greek and the Hebrew and will define the context of the Hebrew and the Greek. I have a software that does that for me. So I just go to the software and it, it tells me exactly how, how it is given. But the preferred translation today is the English Standard Version. It's called ESV. Okay? We started with the King James Version, right? <coughs> and this, they, they say it's a standard version in 1611. Only problem with the King, King James Version is what kind of English do we have there? We have Shakespeare in English. It's very, very old English. So they changed it, and they came up with uh, Revised Standard Version. Okay? to make it simpler, except for when they read the Revised Standard Version, it was so, so dry, you know, <laughs> there was no beauty. So they came up with the NIV, the New International Version. The New International Version, though, the problem was there were some biases in the translators. So some renditions are not that great, okay? So they came up with what they call the NASB, New American Standard Bible. The New American Standard Bible is truer to the manuscripts. Only problem is, it's also dry. So what they did was they got the beauty of the NIV and the accuracy of the NASB. They came up with the English Standard Version. And most evangelical publishing houses now prefer using the English Standard Version as the text because it has beauty and it has accuracy. Uh, Okay, okay, that's another good question, because when we, when we recorded the, the series on apolog apologetics in the Philippines, that was what discovered. Why will I believe the Bible? It's been 2,000 years. It's just like a telephone game, right? You start with the telephone, you, we had this in church, and the elephant turns, no, the, the ant turns into an elephant at the back end. That's a very wrong misconception, because when they translate the Bible, they do not play a telephone game. Every Bible translation goes back to the original manuscripts. You know, if you look at the telephone game, you have 10 people passing that word, you know, over 10 people. The translation of the Bible does not go to pe person number two, number three, number four, number five. If I introduce a new translation, he always goes to person number one. He goes to the original manuscripts. Okay? So if the NAV omitted some of the translation or they messed up in some of the translation, that did not find its way to the NASB because NASB went back to the original languages. That's why you cannot translate the Bible. Have you seen the committee that forms a Bible translation committee? You know what kind of degrees those guys have? 
They got double doctorate degrees in Hebrew and Greek, and they correct each other. If you're a Baptist and I'm a Methodist, hey, you better not inject your Baptist do your Methodist doctrine here. That's not, that's, not, that's not right. You know, it's not balanced. You got to be as careful to be faithful to the original manuscripts as possible. That's why my suggestion is, before you do anything, go to Young's Literal Translation. Okay? Young's Literal Translation, I already discussed this with you. Young's Literal Translation is very similar to the, ex uh, the, the explanation. Uh, I am a Filipino. Uh, Filipino am I. Okay? If I say in Tagalog, ako ay Filipino, what is the translation in English? I am a Filipino. I can also say Filipino am I. Right? I, am I saying the same thing? Yes. But if I want to translate it literally, what is a literal translation? I am a Filipino because ako ay Filipino. Hindi ko sinabing Filipino ay ako. Right? That's the literal translation. Young's literal translation does that. He does not only give you the right translation, he gives you the right format of the subject and the predicate. Okay? And then if it's still too, too heavy for you, then you go to the ESV. And then if you want it even lighter, you can go to the New Living Translation, right? That's the Living Bible before. And if it's still a little complicated, you can go to the Good News Translation. Okay? And if, if it still doesn't buy you anything, there is Bible and Basic English. Okay? I'm listing a lot of stuff, and then you're saying, man, uh, Brother Bing is telling me to buy all of these Bibles. They're very expensive. You don't have to buy them. You just need to go to the internet because these are all available, and you can even compare them. Where do you go to the internet? I thought I gave you guys this address before. It's entitled, it's Bible Study Tools. BibleStudyTools.com Go to BibleStudyTools.com, and once you go to BibleStudyTools.com, there's a drop-down with gazillion, there are gazillion, gazillion versions in the Bible. In fact, it even has a Tagalog version, BibleStudyTools.com. If you want to go search the Bible, you, you can just add slash search, and that will take you, that's one of my favorite. When I did the seminar in the Philippines, we developed sermons with no extra materials except for the Bible. <laughs> We went to the internet. I guided them how to go to the internet, look for illustrations, go to the translation, and we got it here. In fact, with the Bible comes a, comes a commentary. You can just click on the commentary. It will explain to you what it does. So it will be available. But that's, that's the answer, Benji. If you want, what translation do you read? You read as many translations as possible. Now, if you've been, ex if you've been uh, blessed enough to know Hebrew and Greek, <coughs> read it in Hebrew, read it in Greek. Because you know you'll be accurate. Okay, uh, that's why I told you about Richard Davidson last uh, quarter. He's the the head of the Old Testament department in Andrews University. When he when he pursued his doctoral degree, he they lived over three years in Israel, and they did not speak any English word during the three years. They spoke in Hebrew for three years. He wrote in Hebrew. He had classes in Hebrew. Even in their family, they started talking Hebrew. And if you know Hebrew like that, I will not go to the uh, ESV. <laughs> I will go to the original, <laughs> original Hebrew, and I'll read it from there. And if I, if I know Greek, I probably have to brush up on my Greek. I, we were, after Greek too, we were, I challenged our, our professor to translate the entire Gospel of John from scratch. We will do our own translation from the class. We had no time. But if I can go back there again, I will read a Greek New Testament straight from the Greek. That's the best thing to do. Okay? Now it doesn't matter. The God who gave you the Bible is the same God who has provided tools for you to read it and understand it today because he's so eager to reveal himself to you if you're only willing to search for him. That's what he's trying to say. So there's one last note. I, for, I thought I forgot the, the, li the lyrics to the song, but if you, go to the, if you go to the Philippine National Anthem, the last part of the Philippine National Anthem, it goes to the Lupa ng Araw ng Walhatit Pagsinta, Buhay Langit Sa Piling Mo, okay, you know? And then, then the last part, Aming Ligaya Nang Pagmay Nang Aapi Ang Mamatay Nang Dahil Sayo. In English, it says, it will be a joy if there will be oppressors to die for you. Okay, let's not put so much in the metaphor anymore. But there is a, there is a, 
lesson I'd like to leave with you as we end this study today. Because uh, a lot of people died for the Bible. They really didn't die for the Bible. They died for the author of the Bible and the theme of the Bible. Okay? And how did they die? Many of them guys were being burned at the stakes. They were being fed to the lions. And they were singing. Why were they singing? They were not dying in vain. They were dying for their master because they were true disciples of the master. Once you understand what discipleship is about and you understand the preciousness of God's word, it will be a joy to even die for him. For unto you is given not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. And one of these days, this will happen. And if you're going to die to yourselves today and joyfully commit whatever priorities you have to God, it will be very difficult to die for him <laughs> one of these days. I got good news for you, though. You're going to die by just gritting your teeth. You can die for him if you will realize how much he has given to you. If you go back to him every day, you will be so in love with Christ, you will throw away your other distractions and make him first priority in your life. When he becomes first priority, it will be a joy not only to believe, but even to suffer for his sake. And that's true discipleship because we now have a master. Okay? Okay, I, I think uh, Boyd is running out of, uh, <laughs> he reformatted the card. <laughs> We're eating up about 15 gig every time we, we do this. I think that's more than 15 gig now. So let's go. So next week we'll be talking about metaphors, but uh, start reading about discipleship and then start contributing. So. We can help out, uh, especially those who have been faithful in following this series on YouTube. Let's bow our heads in prayer. <coughs> Heavenly Father, thank you for the study we had uh, this afternoon. We start uh, another quarter and uh, come into grips with a very vital um, teaching, a teaching of discipleship. In fact, all of us are disciples, disciples of yours through the gospel of salvation. Oh Lord, as we remember the importance of the Bible in our lives as disciples in our maturity in our Christian walk. May we value the pursuit of you in the scriptures. Teach us to spend time with the scriptures. And Lord, oh Lord, allow the scriptures that we read to transform us and change us, to make a difference in our own lives, in the lives of others, that more people might learn to be disciples themselves and come to glorify you. Be with us for another week. May the things that we've learned today guide us into more maturity in being true disciples of yours. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.